Funding for the reporters is provided by Friends of Channel 4, Incorporated. It is a vacation of unprecedented remoteness. The President of the United States camping out in the wilds of Idaho's backwoods. The fact that Jimmy Carter took such a vacation is unusual enough, but his trip has generated a variety of other interesting and unusual angles. As someone has suggested, never perhaps have so many done so much to see that so few got so far away, and in the process, still generate so much attention. Hi everybody, good to see you. Good evening. It's been 14 years since the President of the United States visited Idaho. And as far as anyone can tell, no president has done what Jimmy Carter is doing here, rafting the middle fork of the Salmon River. The president and most members of his family will be in the state through the better part of the day tomorrow. If we can trust the limited news coverage of the raft trip, we can report with some certainty tonight that by this time, the president and members of his party have settled down to a dinner of sirloin steak, sautéed mushrooms, and fresh strawberries for dessert. Not a particularly important fact taken in the whole scheme of things, just an example of the thousands of words that have been written and spoken about this trip, the first true presidential vacation for Jimmy Carter since he blew into Washington a year and a half ago. This has been a fascinating trip for many, including the White House press corps traveling with the president, and the local press who's been covering this story as a local event and the readers and listeners who have devoured all that information about what the first family is up to. Tonight, we look at the Carter trip from a number of perspectives, including the contention by some that the president has not done enough local glad-handing, not enough patting on the back of local Democratic politicians. We'll also look at some of the local preparations for this trip that have allowed it to come off as successfully as it has so far. A network television producer called the White House press coverage of this event a real dog and pony show. We'll also take a look at that aspect a bit later on. And later, an historical look at Idaho's run-ins with presidents from a reporter who has covered many of those appearances over the years. The president began the Idaho trip with all the pomp and circumstance that is associated with even a low-key arrival by the chief executive. The Idaho press was told days ahead of time that this trip was private, that there would be no public appearances beyond climbing off Air Force One and into the waiting automobile. But looking back now, it's hard to imagine that Jimmy Carter would pass up any kind of friendly crowd. He didn't. Really looking forward to going down the middle four. I'm an old uh, canoeist and uh, kayak, kayaker. You gonna try that? No, I think we'll probably stick with the raft, but I'll, uh, <laughs> if they give you a chance, I'm the canoe, at least. For several days before the president arrived, there was some low-key gnashing of the teeth by local Democrats, who not so subtly gave the impression that they didn't want to be left out of this whole thing. They weren't. Governor John Evans got a few minutes with the president, so did U.S. Senate candidate Dwight Jensen. And although pressed hard by reporters for any sign of being left out, Evans was pleased as punch that his backseat ride was possible. It was his family vacation, it's scheduled that way, and uh, I think when I talk to the people of the state of Idaho, and they, I've had so many people say, Governor, aren't you going to go down the Middle Fork uh, with, with the President? Uh, weren't you invited? And I said, no, I wasn't invited because this is a family. This is a family affair, and to have governors or senators or congressmen also going down the river with them it wouldn't be the same. This is a family thing, and, and I don't know whether I mentioned, but in the car, the president mentioned that, that it's so seldom they get together away from the presidency. And he said, that's the exciting thing about being here in Idaho and being able to do that, is to get away from everybody else and forget it all. Forget it all for a few days. And, and when I tell people of the state of Idaho that, they all say, he's deserving of those days. And everybody says, hooray for the president. He's going to get a few days off. So I think that's the way it should be. And I don't think that it really should be mixed with politics at this particular point. Jimmy Carter was last in Idaho in 1976. He was candidate Carter then, the darling of the Democratic primaries. He stopped in Boise one Saturday afternoon, just days before being beaten in two primaries, Idaho and Oregon, by upstart Senator Frank Church. 
And if Mr. Carter was looking to get away from reporters and crowds on this trip, he was looking very much to draw both reporters and crowds during that 1976 trip. That day, the media was courted with private one-on-one -on -one interviews with the candidate. Carter Press Secretary Jody Powell is comparing the Idaho visit with vacations by then-President Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s and 1940s. Powell said FDR would come for weeks at a time to Warm Springs, Georgia for very private vacations, and his desire for privacy was respected then by the local Georgians. Despite what you might have been led to believe about presidential trips of this magnitude, they are not thrown together in a matter of hours. This trip required weeks of upfront, very sensitive preparation, and literally thousands of hours of installing and reserving and checking and finalizing. And from a distance, the whole thing has the appearance of a Boy Scout jamboree at lunchtime, with everybody under guard. Boise's Roadway Inn lodged the president and is still housing the White House press corps. Tom Judy is the roadway manager. Say one thing, they're very organized, they know exactly what they want, and uh, it's meant us compiling lists and social security numbers, that type of thing, but nothing that has really taken us a lot of time. They're doing most work themselves. It all builds up to that one day, the 12 hours will be here, and uh, they do all the work, and then uh, as soon as he goes, they're on a plane to uh, the next area. Why is it that the, the roadway seems to get all these dignitaries in Boise? We, uh, on this one, about uh, three months ago, we had a major convention here, and we had several, several uh, White House staff members attend that convention, and the recommendation came from them, and so when they found out they were coming to Boise, we just got the call direct. How do you look at all of this? Has it been, uh, it been exciting, uh, interesting? Oh, it's been, it's been real interesting to watch, see how they, uh, how they move, what they do, what they have to look at. And, uh, again, it's been a pleasure because of the way they, they've handled themselves, and they obviously know what they're doing. They've done it a lot. Communications for the president and the press covering his trip have involved perhaps the most extensive pre-trip planning and work. Mountain Bell telephone employees were busy late last week installing an extra microwave dish atop downtown One Capital Center. The microwave was pointed at the roadway in, allowing the local Bell system to handle the hundreds of extra reporter-generated telephone calls that have rung out of the facility this week. Herb Carlson is a Mountain Bell spokesman. Uh, as to stations themselves, what we actually do, we provide what we call a long-distance trunk, which is a telephone that uh, all the newsman has to do is take down the receiver and he automatically <clears throat> winds up on a total switchboard so that the operator can handle his call direct to New York or Washington or wherever his news agency is. And uh, in my judgment, we would probably be uh, putting in facilities to accommodate 30 or 40 such uh, particular setups. You're also working with the, uh, the network so that they can get their, their pictures out of Boise too, right? That's true. We did put in a, a uh, portable microwave uh, arrangement and, uh, for the networks, uh, the CBS, ABC, and NBC uh, television uh, people to do their televising and get their copy back on over the wires. Boise's St. Alphonsus Hospital was given the responsibility of thinking the unthinkable, planning for a presidential mishap. They've put in a, a red, uh, red phone, a hotline that links into the roadway's special switchboard and then is a link to the White House uh, so that if any communications were needed, they would be there. Uh, people are frankly hoping that, that nothing does happen, but uh, certainly they've just had to become more familiar uh, with different procedures in the event that something would happen. I, I heard that uh, some medical records of the presidents had been transferred here. Is that true? Uh, not the in total record. About 10 days ago, a White House staff nurse came out and talked with our uh, assistant administrator in charge of uh, nursing service and provided her with some information about the president and his family, medical information. Uh, in the event that, that something were to happen, those records would be uh, given to us. That's just a sample of some of the local preparation to make this trip possible for the Carters. The president had to do some things of his own before beginning the trip. For one, he had to issue an executive order allowing suspension of some of the rules relating to the Idaho primitive area. The president can do that, and did, allowing extra helicopters to land and ferry in equipment. But perhaps no one prepared for this trip quite like the national media did. 
From satellite transmissions to fleets of helicopters, the White House press came to cover Carter in Idaho in grand and expensive style. If it's possible to pick a leader of the pack in television coverage, that award could go to CBS News as easy as anyone. As he rafts along the river, ahead of and behind him in separate rafts, Secret Service men will be watching to see if anything is... Uh, I busted it. Let's start over. This doesn't work up there, Susan. I know. I've got... You need, a, you need another... Um, let's do... Uh, transition into that yeah, more government yeah. of arming. And I don't uh, mind you yeah. adding a line, because i got the pictures to cover. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I'll just stretch it out here. Let's try again. Is, is this a tough story, an exceptionally tough story for you to cover, just because of the remoteness and the, the difficulty and No, it's and not. It, it, is in a, it, it is in a way and it isn't in a way. I mean, we're not expecting a lot of news to happen here. I mean, we're just arrayed with all these forces that we have, uh, as we always do when the president goes anywhere, just in case something happens. I mean, let's suppose that the Middle East suddenly blows up. Uh, we've got to be ready to cover Jimmy Carter as to what he might do. Uh, there are any number of things, you know. Mm -hmm. And so most of what we do here is just protective coverage. It, uh, we're set up, you know, downtown where we can feed by, by satellite from the hotel where he's staying. So as far as that part of the logistics of it, it's not, it's not difficult. Obviously, you know, getting back and forth to the river and with the tight restrictions we have on coverage set up by the White House, that part is kind of difficult. But the main thing is just to be here and uh, to make sure that, that something of significance does not happen. And if it does, that we're, we're here ready to cover it. Basically, we're 150 to 75 miles from the president right here. Uh, the only people with the president will be one television crew from each of the news networks, and they won't be with him all the time. That is, they spell each other, and they're still uh, perhaps a quarter to a half a mile behind him on the river. So we aren't really covering him like we would like to do. We uh, always feel that we would like to be with the president at all times when he is anywhere outside the White House. But of course, we also understand his desire to get away and to get a little relaxation and a little free time. A lot of people don't like to cover the White House, but I, I really enjoy it. I have always, all my career, back when I was a newspaper man and, and, and down through the years at CBS, I've always worked a beat. I've always enjoyed working a beat. And I'm just one of those odd people who likes to cover spot news. A lot of people, uh, you know, like to do uh, long takeouts, documentaries. Uh, to me, the fun of it is, is being able to get a story out and get it out fast. And, uh, you know, and think that maybe you, you, ex you didn't have much time to, to explain it, but, you know, you didn't, mm -hmm. maybe did a good job on it. Uh, I'm terrible. I just can't keep a secret. I could never work for Newsweek or Time because, you know, they have that, that weekly deadline. And I'd always tell people uh, before the deadline time came, before the magazine came out, what my story was about. So really, this medium was kind of designed for me <laughs> radio and television, because uh, when, when I find out something, I have to tell immediately. Almost every problem that occurs anywhere in the world eventually ends up on the desk of the President of the United States. Uh, I can't think of any major world event that doesn't have an impact on the White House. And as a result, those of us who cover the White House are uh, thrown into all kinds of stories, uh, stories that have wide political, economic impact. And uh, therefore, for a reporter, in a sense, it's one of the, the most fascinating beats anywhere that you could find. Uh, I just find that every day, almost, I'm learning something new even after 21 years. And uh, I also enjoy traveling. I enjoy coming on trips like this. Uh, while it's a lot of work, you still get to meet new people and see new territory. So that it's been a very interesting and a very rewarding life. The Idaho press, to a somewhat lesser degree, also pulled out the stops to cover this whole thing. But no one covered the event more thoroughly with more people and more space than did the Idaho Statesman newspaper. Producer Sid Sprecher has a report now on the local press coverage of the Carter expedition, including a look at the feeling that the local press received some backdoor treatment in its attempts to cover. It's more than obvious that Idaho's largest newspaper, the Idaho Statesman, considers a Carter visit to be an important, if not a dominant, news story. Statesman editor Gary Watson, along with managing editor Rod Sandeen, assistant managing editor Jim Dean, and editorial editor Jim Boyd, have coordinated coverage of the visit that elicits the talents of 12 staff reporters and has featured in recent days articles on every imaginable facet of the presidential visit. I think we would be remiss in not 
giving it full coverage. And then the visit of a president brings a uh, something very new and different to the style of operation in Idaho. You know, if you compare the preparations for a visit by the President of the United States to how our governor moves around the state, you know, at will, with no fault at all and, and sophisticated security and all of this, it, uh, it's uh, something somewhat different for our people. Despite the amount of coverage and the apparent local interest, plans had been announced that did not include the President meeting with local politicians or greeting Idahoans or for that matter, allowing local reporters to cover the float trip down the salmon, although a raft was made available for a pool of national press members. I think what happened is the president originally wanted to take the trip without any press on the boat. And there was a lot of pressure for him to be accompanied on this float trip by some members of the press. The press went so far as to charter, the rumor says, every airplane and helicopter between Salt Lake City and Spokane. And with that kind of pressure, the President's staff, at least, relented and allowed the so-called assassination pool to ride along behind him in, the, in a boat about one mile downstream, upstream from where the president will be. And I don't know if, with that last minute pressure applied on him, if they really considered that the Idaho press ought to have a spot. There was such clamoring from the national press, we probably didn't have enough muscle to get on the boat. It hurts him with the local media, of course. I don't know how sophisticated some Idaho readers and viewers are not to know the difference because we'll be deluged with network coverage and wire service coverage. Sophisticated readers may be able to tell the difference, but most readers probably won't be able to tell the difference. We just think we've been slighted. Not surprisingly, a statesman editorial appeared taking the president to task for the slight. But planned or not, the president did meet with Idaho politicians and press the flesh and kiss the children of Idahoans gathered to meet him. Another statesman editorial in Tuesday's edition noted as much. Nevertheless, those who gathered at the airport were mostly family members of military personnel, clustered away from the public terminal on the far side of Gowan Field. And aside from one member of Boise Media, who offered the attraction of live coverage and who apparently enjoyed at least a modicum of White House access, the president did not meet with members of the local press. Instead, Idaho journalists had to make do with a secondhand account of the president's thoughts through a press conference with Governor Evans. If they had stood with their original position that no one is going to cover it, that would have been fair. We were screaming to cover it, sure we were. But if they had stuck with their original position, it would have been fair. But first they backed down to where well, we're gonna have the protected pool here. And then when the pressure got intense and CBS and NBC and those people started making plans to fly planes all along the river and all this, then they said, well, we'll let you rotate. You can all have a turn but only the national media get to play. Well, that's not fair. We know the river, we know the country, we know the people. It's our story. Perhaps the Idaho news media have been slighted by the President of the United States, and even shoved about by the big kids who represent national news organs. But a larger question that might apply to us all is why commit the time and resources to a story that seems to be more of a event than an issue? I think it's, it's uh, some prestige, also a matter of an obligation to our readers. In a city like Boise, uh, your individual street sales does not fluctuate that much. Uh, certainly we hope we sell some extra papers, sell some at the roadway. There's a bunch of people in town, we want them to see our paper and we hope they buy it. But primarily it's a commitment to our regular day in, day out readers, who I think look to us and expect us as the state's largest newspaper, to provide as complete coverage as we can. Why do you have to have a national issue? It's, it's just plain old interesting. It's something people want to read about. My gosh, a lot of the things we write about aren't important. We write about them anyway, because people like to read it. I don't, I don't see that as a criteria, judging whether we should be there or not. I think it's a fascinating story for the entire nation. The uh, man at CBS, we quoted one of our stories that is a gee whiz story. A man sits down to watch, in Detroit for instance, sits down to watch the six o'clock news and he sees Carter flowing down a wild river in Idaho and he says, gee whiz, that's neat, the president's out on a boat somewhere. That's, that doesn't have an importance really, unless in the sense that this is a test to see if he can take a vacation away from the hordes and crowds that otherwise would surround him. What might be termed as gee whiz journalism 
has come under no small amount of criticism in recent years, much of it directed at television news, although the print media is an enthusiastic participant as well. The fact is we do read and view and listen to such stories. But the presidential visit does confirm one thing. There's a little gee whiz in all of us, perhaps too much in some of us, and perhaps not enough in a few of us. One reporter who has covered many of those appearances over the years is John Corlett, the retired political editor of the Idaho Statesman, and now a panelist on Channel 4's News End program. John, uh, there's been all this talk this week about the president not spending enough time shaking hands and politicking. Is that valid criticism? Well, if he, of course, being out here on a vacation, I think this is the first time in my, that I can recoll recollect that a president came out to Idaho strictly for a vacation. If he came out for any other reason, well, then, of course, uh, we would expect him to uh, uh, be available for people to, uh, to see and, uh, and to shake their hands. This is, <clears throat> uh, most people that I know of uh, want to see the president. But in this instance, uh, at, it's too bad, perhaps, that the president did not, uh, they didn't have fix it up so that he, people could see more of him. He might have got to the other side of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the term, municipal air terminal out there or followed down Capitol Boulevard so people could see him. But uh, he was on a vacation, and uh, I think we have to forgive him for that. You've covered uh, many of these events that we've been witnessing here for the last several days. Uh, what presidential visit that you remember stands out most in your mind? Oh, I think probably, uh, of course, the visit of uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1937 in September, mostly because it was the first president I ever covered, and I was a young man just really starting in this business. I was a sports editor at the time, but I was assigned to cover him. And uh, as, as you know, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was God to many people in those days, uh, in those Depression days. And uh, I was rather excited about it myself. And uh, he did attract a great crowd uh, on the streets of Boise. Uh, he was in an open touring car on Capitol Boulevard, in, on, which was on 7th Street in front of the uh, State House. I can't tell you how many people were there, but there were many, many there. And he spoke uh, briefly, not at too great a length. And uh, uh, then he went on a tour, on a, on a, to hit the press, and uh, they loaded him into cars, not into buses, and went on a tour through the valley. How about some other uh, uh, that you remember? Anything uh, extraordinary? Well, uh, Harry Truman visited Idaho three times, uh, twice as a president and, and once as a, a, after he was president. And the first time uh, he came to Sun Valley, an invitation of uh, Averill Harriman, and he dedicated an airport in Cary, Idaho. Uh, we didn't see too much of him. He came in and stayed in, in the Harriman Cottage, and uh, incidentally, that was kind of a, a kind of a quiet place for him when he came. He came in by train to send money to catch him. And the next morning, they were up bright and early at about six o'clock in the morning, as I recall, to make that bus trip across country to Idaho Falls to get on the train again. The train had been moved around overnight uh, to Idaho Falls, I believe, but they crossed that country, and he dedicated a uh, a. Uh, airport at Cary and then went on. We've all been, uh, those of us locally here, have been watching the national press cover this story, the White House press, uh, which is nothing unusual for them, but uh, it is unusual for us to see them in action. Did the national press cover the president uh, years ago the way they do now? Obviously they didn't with television, but were these great hordes of people following the president around? Uh, not quite, well, <laughs> you're absolutely correct. It was primarily print media and radio, of course, in those days. Uh, the early times, of course, were by train, which was really fun, uh, as I view it now in retrospect, uh, compared to the way they have to travel by planes this time. But yes, there were, you had just specials, and of course, the wire service people, and I, I would assume that you had between 100 and 150 press people with the president each time. And he was joined as he went along uh, by locals uh, who also got on, the, the Boise Statesman, uh, the, spoke to the Spokesman Review, the Portland paper and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they all piled on their trains and went. And I think they do on planes today for that matter. Do we, do we have some, uh, a case of press overkill on this, on this particular visit, do you think? Well, it seems like uh, 
uh, an awful lot uh, for, a, for a vacation and a trip down the Middle Fork, but I, I think the press uh, uh, wanted to get into it too. I think they, uh, uh, just the idea of, of having to do this and, and getting at it, uh, it was kind of a rough sort of a thing. And uh, I think the challenge was there, and I think they accepted the challenge. I know the president undoubtedly wanted to go down and be by himself, and he would have been very happy if the press was not with him. And I think the press just decided, well, they were going to go. I, I think they have to be with the president at all times. I don't blame them at all, because uh, this is part of the job and part of the, part of the business. And this always has been. They always have to be with the president. I heard a, a woman, uh, well, actually, she spoke directly to me at the airport uh, Monday, saying, uh, why do we have to know every move the president makes? Uh, he's a private man. He has his private life. Uh, but does he really? The press obviously uh, is, is there. Uh, you, some, of the, uh, some of the small things in the reports are just uh, amazing. What he had for breakfast and uh, what he's going to have for dinner, what kind of clothing he wore, the fact that he didn't have any socks on when he got on the, uh, on the raft. Uh, uh, have we gone too far in, uh, in, in reporting every possible thing that the president Oh, I suppose we have really and truly, but as a, as a reporter myself, why you, I can understand that I, uh, the president is, is not a private individual, he's a public individual anymore, he's a public official, he's a president, just like the governor. The governor ought to be, we ought to do more with the governor for that matter, and, and really, uh, and really uh, report him better than we do. But uh, this is all a part of the process, and I think it grew up uh, over the years, and I don't think it's any worse now than it was uh, 40 years ago, for that matter. Every word that the president says uh, is reported, and uh, somebody has to be there to report it. I hope they can be there. Sometimes they're not. I, I imagine that uh, the President Carter on that raft is glad that he has no newspaper men around. We'll have to leave it there, John. Thank you. That's all for tonight. We'll take next week off so that this pot can be devoted to coverage of the Western Idaho Fair. And we'll be back with a daily program beginning right after the 1st of September. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night. This program was produced by KAID-TV, which is solely responsible for its content.